Welcome to Sensible Secondhand Classics, the series where we look at uh, cars that you can buy that are over 15 years old for a budget of between one and five thousand pounds. This is a 1995 Rover 820 Vitesse Sport Turbo, and uh, well, it's uh, absolutely wonderful views. So the Rover 800 was the sister car to the original Honda Legend and it was launched in 1986. This is the later R17 facelifted model which came out in late 1991 and um, it's what some would consider the most desirable version being the uh, 820 Turbo with 200 horsepower. The basic engine in the 800s was actually a 2 litre, like this is, a very distantly related V0 series engine to this T series um, that generated just 100 horsepower with a carburetor. The base model 820 was not made for very long, I think it was made for like 1988 to 1990. If you want to see one of those, then obviously look at Ian Seabrook's Hub Nut channel because he used to have one. Above that, there was the 820E or SE. That had the same engine known as the M series, I believe, in the pre facelift models, with um, I think it was 120 horsepower. Then we get to the one that's probably familiar to many people. It's a, initially a 2 litre M series with um, multi-point fuel injection but later the 2 litre T-series that had anywhere between 134-136 horsepower and uh, that continued right the way to the end. The uh, T-series engine was introduced for the 1992 model year. Before that um, the M-series which produced very similar power outputs, so there wasn't really a lot of difference between the um, previous M-series and the T-series in either the uh, multiple fuel injection or the um, uh, turbo version. We then got on to, uh, well, more interesting things, this turbo. Initially when it came out, it was called the 820 Turbo, and uh, that generated 180 horsepower. This later version, the, um, the Test Sport, generates 197 horsepower. It's a very similar engine to the one in the Rover 200 Tomcat Turbo as well. Then we get to the V6s. Now initially the V6 engine in one of these was um, the 2.5 Honda engine and that generated 173 horsepower. The uh, 2.5 was replaced with 2.7, I think around 1988, I'm not entirely sure, I can't remember now. That generated 169 horsepower. I don't know why the um, the actual power output went down, the engine was enlarged, I, I don't know. Uh, but that continued right away through to 1996 when the Honda engine was replaced by Rover's own KV6 with, um, I think it was a 172 horsepower. There are also some diesels available, but as usual, due to controversial government legislation and all kinds of other reasons, well, we don't talk about diesels on this channel. Well, views, it's a little bit busier here than it normally would be when we do sensible second-hand classics, but this is the opportunity that I've got to film this car, and so we shall continue. There's a very nice French registered um, 800 coupe next to uh, Dan's car today. So this is the uh, facelifted Rover 800, known as the R17 facelift, which was made from late 91 to 1999. The, uh, the test sport was a, a, a trim until the um, minor facelift that occurred with the KV6 engine being introduced in 1996 
and you can see the grille fins of this car are black which means it's uh, before that particular facelift happened. So we've got uh, Nigel in the back, we'll uh, have more of a look at him later, he looks uh, a bit uncomfortable in there. We think this car was actually the brochure car for this particular brochure on here, I'll just move that there. There he goes with the test sport. Isn't that lovely? This is actually a 94 brochure. The car was made in 1994, registered in January 1995. I cannot believe that he actually he actually paid less than um, less than three thousand pounds for this car, but he did because it's virtually immaculate. There are some things that don't quite work. There is um, there is actually a, a leak on the exhaust system in this car and uh, the electric windows don't always work very well so I've been told not to touch them but that's okay I'm just going to uh, open the door so we can have a look at Nigel being very comfortable look at that look at all that space and uh, yes we've got this common issue here which we demonstrate with Nigel sitting there um, we actually have a sucky headlining which is a bit of a problem Right, I'm just going to dump this bag that I'm wearing and uh, I'll sit beside Nigel who's uh, yeah, going to have to stay there for a bit. There is uh, Dan's Instagram channel if you want to follow his massive collection of uh, Rovers and MGs, HPR and School Photo. So the doors open nice and wide and of course we've got some wood. I mean, personally I would like a sterling, that's just the sort of person I am. That coupe's got a beige leather interior, maybe that's for me. But some of you will love this uh, Vitesse Sport. I like it too. So we've got infinitely adjustable kind of there with the little lumbar bits everything. Isn't that great? There's actually loads of room in here. Dan's quite tall and uh, I've got loads of room. I've got loads of headroom as well actually too. I'm not that tall, I'm about 5 foot 11. So maybe not the best but there we go. If you're very corpulent like Nigel is, then uh, even you can get comfortable. Right, put your paw there. Stay. Okay, have a look at the armrest. Yes, mm, leather, leather armrest. Very nice. So not entirely leather upholstery, there's a bit of fabric inserts in there, but that's quite common for very sporty little cars, isn't it? Well, this, is, this car's little, it's very big. Electric windows in the back. Um, don't know if that's a reflector or it actually should light up, I'm not sure. I mean, the, some of the trims, it's a, very old. I mean, this is a car from 1995. So, it, you know, you can't expect everything, can you? But that looks pretty good, really. I think the quality of these and the interior was a little bit better than the earlier XX um, model 800s, but I wouldn't be able to say, really. Um, but it's, it's hard to tell these days. It depends how cars be maintained somehow. Adjustable height front seat belts. It does feel like in here um, a larger Rover 200 or 400. I think that's not surprising really because the 200 and 400 VR8 model was launched only about three years after this. We've actually got a little uh, No, non-damped handles. I thought these would be lights in here, but they're not. That's annoying to you. Maybe if you had a Sterling, that's what you'd get. I think the Sterlings also, some of them at least, had uh, reclining electric rear seats. But loads of room. You could get a longer version than this, I think. But I mean, that would do me perfectly. Got some nice alloy wheels on this one, as in the brochure. What size is this? 17 inches. Gosh, it's pretty big for 1995. And also, this is generally quite a big car, considering this is originally designed um, in the, the early 1980s. It is quite big for that era. Mmm. Yes, very big. Right, let's have a look in. Uh, let's have a look in the boot. So I've just used the key to open the boot. I mean, you can. You can also use the interior release. Look at all this space. This is ridiculous. I'm not surprised they didn't make an 800 estate because, well, you wouldn't need it. Look at all this. The post-faced saloons do have a larger boot 
uh, the styling was considerably changed. The black strips as well identify this as uh, you know one of the earlier facelift cars. Nice exhaust on the back there. Yeah, I mean, you if you can't fit all your stuff in here for your sales meeting, then you know you've got something coming to you, haven't you? Right, I think it's time to have a look at some of the features of the dashboard and things like that, and then we'll take a look at this wonderful T-Series turbo engine. It's funny, I think some of the wood in this car has just slightly discoloured. I mean, overall, this car's in fantastic condition, but that wood should actually match that and this. So I don't know what's going on here, it doesn't matter. But yeah, very comfortable seats. This uh, steering wheel, I think, stayed with the 800 until the end of its production life in 1999. It's kind of similar to the uh, pre-facelift dash, but got an airbag in here, and uh, we've got actually this car an aftermarket boost gauge and a nice Sony stereo in here. Five-speed manual. I think the Vitesses were manual, as far as I remember. Things like the Sterlings, of course. Yes, a nice automatic gearbox. Door panels do look very sort of 1980s, don't they? Um, Probably wasn't too much they could do about about that as the life of this car went on. There are the fog light switches up here. Uh, storks look a little bit more sort of modern. I think similar to like Land Rovers or something at the time. Don't know viewers. Um, we've got an armrest in here. Dan's got things in there as well. Yeah, unfortunately it's a little bit cracked. It's not the biggest thing in the world though, is it? So I think that's. Um, there's something to do with um, the locking button for the windows, I might be wrong. Um, oh, there we go, there's the uh, courtesy light somewhere in the front. Fuel, filler release and boot release are there. Has the light switches down there, and that's dashboard illumination. Does this open, viewers? Ooh, that's quite, that's actually quite a nice action. Let's do that again. I like that. It's very pleasant. So, uh, no cup holders, unfortunately, as uh, Dan's demonstrated here with uh, his uh, his bottle. But I think we have variable speed intermittent wipe. Excellent. That's very handy. I think, though, the rear wiper controls up here, which is really weird. Um, otherwise, these are the heating and ventilation controls, I think very similar to the earlier ones. Let's open up glove box. I'm afraid these secret mission documents are not going in there, viewers. Because uh, because I'm at the event and I'm just filming this uh, so quickly, um, but, but there's, there's no opportunity to take all the stuff out of this car. So very clear instruments, very similar again to um, some of the other smaller rovers of the time, such as the 200 and 400. Very similar dash to, to those and again, you know, sort of Honda-based type things, very easy to read. Speedo in the right increments for this country because we tend to have lots of 30 and 50 mile an hour speed lips as well as the 71 of course. Nice comfy seats made by Recaro. Most agreeable. Right let's have a look at this uh, amazing engine then. Dead fancy viewers, gas struts. So 2 litre T-series turbo developing about 197 horsepower. More power actually than the uh, the V6s. I think that red lettering on the top of there is standard, I'm not sure, but there was a normally aspirated version of this engine available too, which is in far more cars. There was also a slightly less powerful turbo of 100, I think 180 horsepower as well, but this is Vitesse Sport, so it has the full works. And someone's got an interesting air filter on there too. Right, well, uh, I think it's time to go for another drive, viewers. As far as the trim lot options go for the Rover 800, there was just the base 820 with no trim detonation at all. Then there was um, things like the E and SE, and then the I. There were lots and lots of I's, 825i, 827i, 20i and then the uh, SI's um, something like I don't know 820 SI 
things like that. The SLI above that was the um, last kind of normal trim because uh, above that you got stuff like the Sterling, which was the luxurious version. And I like luxury viewers um, very, very much the luxury version. It was always the one that I go for. Sterling did change during the life of the car. I mean, when you're selling a car for 13 years, you do expect some changes. Initially, it was the absolute top spec in every way with the, you know, the electric reclining rear seats and stuff like that. Um, it was very early Sterling that I saw like a deep registration one at um, the NEC Plastic Restoration Show uh, just last month. Very nice. Ben of the Tess, which came with the hatchback version of the car, it was launched around 1988. Towards the end of the car's life, I think around the time of the 1996 minor facelift, you could get a sterling hatch and things like that, so they sort of mix it up a bit. There was also an SE Special Edition at uh, one stage, it was distinct from the, uh, the SE that was you know, the earlier one, which had the single point fuel injection engine. In terms of what this car's like to drive, it's it's very comfortable. The thing I would say is the steering is very, very, very over-assisted. Incredibly over-assisted. Like there's no weight to it whatsoever. And when you're driving this car and thinking like, you know, the police used to use these in, in high-speed chases, it's a little bit disconcerting actually to drive something that's it's just got no steering fit at all. I think it's supposed to have the positive centre field power steering system, but I can't feel anything. <laughs> it's really odd. Um, something that you know is this fast and has, I think, not 60 time under seven seconds, and will do 150 miles an hour or something like that. I would really prefer something that had a bit more weight to the steering. Um, maybe I shouldn't worry about such things, viewers, but uh, but I do. But at least this is a, a, a very high performance car. It's actually quite easy to drive, the ride's not too bad, um, it's not very firm, obviously the sterling would be better in terms of the ride comfort, but this is, this, I don't think you really would complain. Um, the handling's fine, um, but there is a bit of body lean I think on some of the models, it's like the 820 that I drove, 2021 that would belong to um, Sergeant Langstaff, I think it was a 1990 is one. Um, that was a lot more floaty than this. This feels a lot tighter. But yes, it's, it's nice. You've just got to be very aware of this car, but it's so unbelievably massive that when you park it, you do feel like you're trying to park an ocean liner. Fortunately, you've got a very good all-run visibility and you could get parking sensors sort of towards the end. So, you know, that's not too bad, is it? Lloyd Living Consulting stickers, t-shirts and mugs are available by clicking the link to the Google form in the video description below. So viewers, from uh, Nigel in the back and me, should you consider a Rover 820 as a sensible second-hand classic? Well, you've got to watch for rust. You've got to watch for electrical faults. You've got to make sure on this particular engine that you do the cam belt. And I think the water pump's driven separately on this, so uh, just be wary of that too. The V6s are very, very complicated to work on. They're much more crammed into the engine bay than, than this is, and the KV6 has issues all of its own. But yeah, something like a T-Series is normally aspirated, one of those, they're generally quite reliable engines, actually, if you look after them. But... I quite like this view, it's not really a surprise. I, I asked um, Dan, who owns this car, um, if I could have a go in it when he bought it uh, last month, and uh, he said yes, which was very nice of him. Um, it's just a shame I've got to give this back now. Um, it sort of made me think I might want one of these at some stage. Probably a Sterling, because uh, that's what I like. Um, but even, you know, the sort of late uh, two-litre normally aspirated models are quite well-equipped, actually. Um, there's one that, uh, you know, somebody I know owns, and that, that's very nice, actually. Anyway, thank you ever so much indeed once again for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. I'll just leave a comment below. And uh, we shall 
see you again soon for more reasonably priced nostalgia. <laughs>